The Wendigo, Part 5, by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jackson Vallone from TypicalJax.com. Part 5. For a man of his years and experience, only a canny Scot, perhaps, grounded in common sense and established in logic, could have preserved even that measure of balance that his youth somehow or other did manage, to preserve through the whole adventure. Otherwise, who things he presently noticed while forging pluckily ahead must have sent him headlong back to the comparative safety of his tent, instead of only making his hands close more tightly upon the rifle stock, while his heart, trained for the wee kirk, sent a wordless prayer, winging its way to heaven. Both tracks, he saw, had undergone a change, and this change, so far as it concerned the footsteps of the man, was in some indecipherable manner appalling. It was the bigger tracks he first noticed this, and for a long time he could not quite believe his eyes. Was it the blown leaves that produced odd effects of light and shade, or that dry snow, drifting like finely ground rice around the edges, cast shadows and highlights, or was it actually the fact that the great marks had become faintly colored? For round about the deep, plunging holes of the animal there now appeared a mysterious, reddish tinge that was more like an effect of light than anything that dyed the substance of the snow itself. Every mark had it, and had it increasingly, this indistinct, fiery tinge that painted a new touch of ghastliness into the picture. But when, wholly unable to explain or to credit it, he turned his attention to the other tracks to discover if they, too, bore similar witness. He noticed that these had meanwhile undergone a change that was infinitely worse. A change with far more horrible suggestion. For, in the last hundred yards or so, he saw that they had grown gradually into the semblance of the parent tread. Imperceptibly, the change had come about, yet unmistakably. It was hard to see where the change first began. The result, however, was beyond question. Smaller, neater, more cleanly modeled... They formed now an exact and careful duplicate of the larger tracks beside them. The feet that produced them had therefore also changed, and something in his mind reared up with loathing and with terror as he saw it. Simpson, for the first time, hesitated. Then, ashamed of his alarm and indecision, took a few hurried steps ahead. The next instant stopped dead in his tracks. Immediately in front of him, all signs of the trail ceased. Both tracks came to an abrupt end on all sides. For a hundred yards and more, he searched in vain for the least indication of their continuance. There was nothing. The trees were very thick, just there. Big trees, all of them. Spruce, cedar, hemlock. There was no underbrush. He stood, looking about him, all distraught, bereft of any power of judgment. Then he set to work to search again. And again, and yet again, but always with the same result, nothing. The feet that printed the surface of the snow thus far had now apparently left the ground, and it was in that moment of distress and confusion that the whip of terror laid its most nicely calculated lash about his heart. It dropped with deadly effect upon the sore spot of all, completely unnerving him. He had been secretly dreading all the time that it would come, and it did. Far overhead, muted by great height and distance, strangely thinned and wailing, he heard the crying voice of Defago, the guide. The sound dropped upon him out of that still, wintry sky with an effect of dismay and terror unsurpassed. The rifle fell to his feet. He stood motionless an instant, listening as it were with his whole body, then staggered back against the nearest tree for support, disorganized helplessly in mind and spirit. To him, in that moment, it seemed the most shattering and dislocating experience he had ever known, so that his heart emptied itself of all feeling whatsoever, as by a sudden draught. Oh, oh, this fiery height. Oh, my feet of fire. My burning feet of fire. Ran in far, beseeching accents of indescribable appeal, this voice of anguish down the sky. Once it called, the silence ran through all the listening wilderness of trees. And Simpson... Scarcely knowing what he did, presently found himself running wildly to and fro, searching, calling, tripping over roots and boulders, 
flinging himself in a frenzy of undirected pursuit after the caller. Behind the screen of memory and emotion with which experience veils events, he plunged, distracted and half deranged, picking up false lights like a ship at sea, terror in his eyes and heart and soul, for the panic of the wilderness had called to him in that far voice, the power of untamed distance, the enticement of the desolation that destroys. He knew, in that moment, all the pains of someone helplessly and irretrievably lost, suffering the lust and travail of a soul in the final loneliness, a vision of Defago, eternally hunted, driven, and pursued across the sky, driven and pursued across the skyey vastness of those ancient forests fled like a flame across the dark ruin of his thoughts. It seemed ages before he could find anything in the chaos of his disorganized sensations to which he could anchor himself steady for a moment and think. The cry was not repeated. His own hoarse calling brought no response. The inscrutable forces of the wild had summoned their victim beyond recall and held him fast. Yet he searched and called. It seems for hours afterwards, for it was late in the afternoon when at length he decided to abandon a useless pursuit and returned to his camp on the shores of Fifty Island Water. Even then, he went with reluctance, that crying voice still echoing in his ears. With difficulty, he found his rifle and the homeward trail, the concentration necessary to follow the badly blazed trees and a biting hunger that gnawed, helped to keep his mind steady. Otherwise, he admits, the temporary aberration he had suffered might have been prolonged to the point of positive disaster. Gradually, the balance shifted back again, and he regained something that approached his normal equilibrium. But for all that, the journey through the gathering dusk was miserably haunted. He heard innumerable following footsteps, voices that laughed and whispered, and saw figures crouching behind trees and boulders, making signs to one another for a concerted attack the moment he had passed. The creeping murmur of the wind made him start and listen, he went stealthily, trying to hide where possible, and making as little sound as he could. The shadows of the woods, hitherto protective or covering merely, had now become menacing, challenging. And the pageantry in his frightened mind masked a host of possibilities that were all the more ominous for being obscure. The presentiment of a nameless doom lurked ill-concealed behind every detail of what had happened. It was really admirable how he emerged victor in the end. Men of riper powers and experience might have come through the ordeal with less success. He had himself tolerably well in hand, all things considered, and his plan of action proves it. Sleep being absolutely out of the question, and traveling an unknown trail in the darkness equally impracticable, he sat up the whole of that night, rifle in hand, before a fire he could never for a single moment allow to die down. The severity of the haunted vigil marked his soul for life, but it was successfully accomplished, and with the very first signs of dawn he set forth upon the long return journey to the home camp to get help. As before, he left a written note to explain his absence, and to indicate where he had left a plentiful cachet of food and matches, though he had no expectation that any human hands would find them. How Simpson found his way alone by the lake and forest might well make a story in itself, for to hear him tell it is to know the passionate loneliness of soul that a man can feel when the wilderness holds him in the hollow of its illimitable hand and laughs. It is also to admire his indomitable pluck. He claims no skill, declaring that he followed the most invisible trail mechanically and without thinking, and this, doubtless, is the truth. He relied upon the guiding of the unconscious mind, which is instinct. Perhaps, too, some sense of orientation, known to animals and primitive men, may have helped as well. For through all that tangled region, he succeeded in reaching the exact spot where Defago had hidden the canoe nearly three days before with the remark, strike due west, across the lake, into the sun, to find the camp. There was not much sun left to guide him, but he used his compass to the best of his ability, embarking in the frail craft for the last twelve miles of his journey with a sensation of immense relief that the forest was at last behind him. And, fortunately, the water was calm. He took his line across the center of the lake, instead of coasting around the shores for another twenty miles. Fortunately, too, the other hunters were back, 
The light of their fires furnished a steering point, without which he might have searched all night long for the actual position of the camp. It was very close upon midnight, all the same when his canoe grated on the sandy cove, and Hank, Punk, and his uncle, disturbed in their sleep by his cries, ran quickly down and helped a very exhausted and broken specimen of Scotch humanity over the rocks toward a dying fire. Part 6 the sudden entrance of his prosaic uncle into this world of wizardry and horror that had haunted him without interruption now for two days and two nights had the immediate effect of giving to the affair an entirely new aspect. The sound of that crisp, hello my boy, and what's up now, and the grasp of that dry and vigorous hand introduced another standard of judgment. A revulsion of feeling washed through him. He realized that he had let himself go rather badly. He even felt vaguely ashamed of himself. The native hard-headedness of his race reclaimed him. And this doubtless explains why he found it so hard to tell that group around the fire. Everything. He told enough, however, for the immediate decision to be arrived at that a relief party must start at the earliest possible moment, and that Simpson, in order to guide it capably, must first have food, and above all, sleep. Dr. Cathcart, observing the lad's condition more shrewdly than his patient knew, gave him a very slight injection of morphine. For six hours, he slept like the dead. From the description carefully written out afterwards by the student of divinity, it appears that the account he gave to the astonished group omitted sundry vital and important details. He declares that, with his uncle's wholesome, matter-of-fact countenance staring him in the face, he simply had not the courage to mention them. Thus, all the search party gathered, it would seem, was that Defago had suffered in the night an acute and inexplicable attack of mania, had imagined himself called by someone or something, and he had plunged into the bush after it without food or rifle, where he must die a horrible and lingering death by cold and starvation unless he could be found and rescued in time. In time, moreover, meant at once. In the course of the following day, however, they were off by seven, leaving Punk in charge with instructions to have food and fire always ready. Simpson found it possible to tell his uncle a good deal more of the story's true inwardness, without divining that it was drawn out of him as a matter of fact by a very subtle form of cross-examination. By the time they reached the beginning of the trail, where the canoe was laid up against the return journey, he had mentioned how Defago spoke vaguely of something called a Wendigo, how he cried in his sleep how he imagined an unusual scent about the camp, and had betrayed other symptoms of mental excitement. He also admitted the bewildering effect of that extraordinary odor upon himself, pungent and acrid like the odor of lions. And by the time they were within an easy hour of Fifty Island water, he had let slip the further fact, a foolish avowal of his own hysterical condition, as he felt afterwards, that he had heard the vanished guide call for help. He omitted the singular phrases used, for he simply could not bring himself to repeat the preposterous language. Also, while describing how the man's footsteps in the snow had gradually assumed an exact miniature likeness of the animal's plunging tracks, he left out the fact that they measured a wholly incredible distance. It seemed a question, nicely balanced between individual pride and honesty. What should he reveal, and what suppress? He mentioned the fiery tinge in the snow, for instance, yet shrank from telling that body in bed had been partly dragged out of the tent, with that net result that Dr. Cathcart, a droid psychologist that he fancied himself to be, had assured him clearly enough exactly where he is mind, influenced by loneliness, bewilderment, and terror, had yielded to the strain and invited delusion. While praising his conduct, he managed at the same time to point out where, when, and how his mind had gone astray, he made his nephew think himself finer than he was by judicious praise, yet more foolish than he was by minimizing the value of the evidence. Like many other materialists, that is, he lied cleverly on the basis of insufficient knowledge, because the knowledge supplied seemed to his own particular intelligence inadmissible. The spell of these terrible solitudes, he said, cannot leave any mind untouched, any mind, that is, possessed of the higher imaginative qualities, it has worked upon yours exactly as it worked upon my own when I was your age. The animal that haunted your little camp was undoubtedly a moose. 
for the belling of a moose may have sometimes a very peculiar quality of sound. The colored appearance of the big tracks was obviously a defect of vision in your own eyes produced by excitement. The size and stretch of the tracks we shall prove when we come to them. But the hallucination of an audible voice, of course, is one of the commonest forms of delusion due to mental excitement. An excitement, my dear boy, perfectly excusable, and let me add, wonderfully controlled by you under the circumstances. For the rest, I am bound to say, you have acted with a splendid courage, for the terror of feeling oneself lost in this wilderness is nothing short of awful, and had I been in your place, I don't think for a moment I could have behaved with one quarter of your wisdom and decision. The only thing I find it uncommonly difficult to explain is that damned odor. It made me feel sick, I assure you, declared his nephew, positively dizzy. His uncle's attitude of calm omniscience, merely because he knew more psychological formulae, made him slightly defiant. It was so easy to be wise in the explanation of an experience one has not personally witnessed. A kind of desolate and terrible odor is the only way I can describe it, he concluded, glancing at the features of the quiet, unemotional man beside him. I can only marvel, was the reply that under the circumstances it did not seem to you even worse. The dry words, Simpson knew, hovered between the truth and his uncle's interpretation of the truth. And so at last they came to the little camp and found the tent still standing, the remains of the fire, and a piece of paper pinned to a stake beside it, untouched. The cachet, poorly contrived by inexperienced hands, however, had been discovered and opened by muskrats, mink, and squirrel. The matches lay scattered about the opening, but the food had been taken to the last crumb. "'Well, fellers, he ain't here,' exclaimed Hank loudly after his fashion. "'And that's as certain as the coal supply down below. But where he's got to by this time is about as uncertain as the trade in crowns in the other place.' The presence of a divinity student was no barrier to his language at such time, though for the reader's sake it may be severely edited. "'I propose,' he added, "'that we start out at once and hunt for him like hell.' The gloom of Defago's probable fate oppressed the whole party with a sense of dreadful gravity the moment they saw the familiar signs of recent occupancy, especially the tent. With a bed of balsam branches still smoothed and flattened by the pressure of his body, seemed to bring his presence near to them. Simpson, feeling vaguely as if his world were somehow at stake, went about explaining particulars in a hushed tone. He was much calmer now. Though overwearied with the strain of his many journeys, his uncle's method of explaining, explaining away, rather, the details still fresh in his haunted memory helped too, to put ice upon his emotions. And that's the direction he ran off in, he said to his two companions, pointing in the direction where the guide had vanished that morning in the gray dawn. Straight down there, he ran like a deer, in between the birch and the hemlock. Hank and Dr. Cathcart exchanged glances. And it was about two miles down there, in a straight line, continued the other, speaking with something of the former terror in his voice, that I followed his trail to the place where it stopped, dead, and where you heard him calling and caught the stench and all the rest of the wicked entertainment, cried Hank, with a volubility that betrayed his keen distress, and where your excitement overcame you to the point of producing illusions, added Dr. Cathcart under his breath, yet not so low that his nephew did not hear it. It was early in the afternoon, for they had traveled quickly, and there was still a good two hours of daylight left. Dr. Cathcart and Hank lost no time in beginning the search, but Simpson was too exhausted to accompany them. They would follow the blazed marks on the trees, and where possible his footsteps. Meanwhile, the best thing he could do was to keep a good fire going and rest. But after something like three hours' search, the darkness already down, the two men returned to camp with nothing to report. Fresh snow had covered all signs, and though they had followed the blazed trees to the spot where Simpson had turned back, they had not discovered the smallest indication of a human being, or for that matter, of an animal. There were no fresh tracks of any kind. The snow lay undisturbed. It was too difficult to know what was best to do, though in reality there was nothing more they could do. They might stay and search for weeks without much chance of success. The fresh snow destroyed their only hope and they gathered round the fire for supper. A gloomy and despondent party. The facts, indeed, were sad enough, for Defago had a wife at Rat Portage, and his earnings were the family's sole means of support. 
now that the whole truth and all its ugliness was out. It seemed useless to deal in further disguise or pretense. They talked openly of the facts and probabilities. It was not the first time, even in the experience of Dr. Cathcart, that a man had yielded to the singular seduction of the solitudes and gone out of his mind. The Fago, moreover, was predisposed to something of the sort, for he already had a touch of melancholia in his blood, and his fiber was weakened by bouts of drinking that often lasted for weeks at a time. Something on his trip, one might never know precisely what, had sufficed to push him over the line. That was all. And he had gone, gone off into the great wilderness of trees and lakes to die by starvation and exhaustion. The chances against his finding camp again were overwhelming. The delirium that was upon him would also doubtless have increased, and it was quite likely he might do violence to himself, and so hasten his cruel fate. Even while they talked, indeed the end had probably come. On the suggestion of Hank, his old pal, however, they proposed to wait a little longer and devote the whole of the following day, from dawn to darkness, to the most systematic search they could devise. They would divide the territory between them. They discussed their plan in great detail. All that men could do, they would do. And meanwhile, they talked about the particular form in which the singular panic of the wilderness had made its attack upon the mind of the unfortunate guide. Hank, though familiar with the legend in its general outline, obviously did not welcome the turn the conversation had taken. He contributed little, though that little was illuminating, for he admitted that a story had ran over all this section of country to the effect that several Indians had seen the Wendigo along the shores of Fifty Island Water in the fall of last year, and that this was the true reason of Defago's disinclination to hunt there. Hank doubtless felt that he had in a sense helped his old pal to death by over-persuading him. When an Indian goes crazy, he explained, talking to himself more than to the others, it seemed, it's always put that he's seen the Wendigo, and poor old Defago was superstitious down to his very heels. And then Simpson, feeling the atmosphere more sympathetic, told over again the full story of his astonishing tale. He left out no details this time. He mentioned his own sensations and gripping fears. He only omitted the strange language used. But Defago surely had already told you all these details of the Wendigo legend, my dear fellow, insisted the doctor. I mean, he had talked about it, and thus put it into your mind, the ideas which your own excitement afterwards developed. Whereupon Simpson again repeated the facts. Defago, he declared, had barely mentioned the beast. He, Simpson, knew nothing of the story, and so far as he remembered, had never even read about it. Even the word was unfamiliar. Of course, he was telling the truth, and Dr. Cathcart was reluctantly compelled to admit the singular character of the whole affair. He did not do this in words so much as in manner, however. He kept his back against a good stout tree. He poked the fire into a blaze the moment it showed signs of dying down. He was quicker than any of them to notice the least sound in the night about them. A fish jumping in the lake, a twig snapping in the bush, the dropping of occasional fragments of frozen snow from the branches overhead where the heat loosened them. His voice, too, changed a little in quality, becoming a shade less confident, lower also in tone. Fear, to put it plainly, hovered close about that little camp. And though all three would have been glad to speak of other matters, the only thing they seemed to be able to discuss was this, the source of their fear. They tried other subjects in vain. There was nothing to say about them. Hank was the most honest of the group. He said next to nothing. He never once, however, turned his back to the darkness. His face was always to the forest, and when wood was needed, he didn't go farther than was necessary to get it. Part 7 A wall of silence wrapped them in. For the snow, though not thick, was sufficient to deaden any noise, and the frost held things pretty tight besides. No sound but their voices and the soft roar of the flames made itself heard. Only from time to time something soft as the flutter of a pine moth's wings went past them through the air. No one seemed anxious to go to bed. The hours slipped towards midnight. The legend is picturesque enough, observed the doctor after one of the longer pauses speaking to break it rather than because he had anything to say. For the Wendigo is simply the call of the wild personified, which some natures hear to their own destruction. That's about it, Hank said presently. 
and there's no misunderstanding when you hear it. It calls you by name right enough. Another pause followed. Then Dr. Cathcart came back to the forbidden subject with a rush that made the others jump. The allegory is significant, he remarked, looking about him into the darkness. For the voice, they say, resembles all the minor sounds of the bush. Wind, falling water, cries of the animals, and so forth. And once the victim hears that, he's off for good. Of course. His most vulnerable points, moreover, are said to be the feet and the eyes. The feet, you see, for the lust of wandering, and the eyes for the lust of beauty. The poor beggar goes at such a dreadful speed that he bleeds beneath the eyes, and his feet burn. Dr. Cathcart, as he spoke, continued to peer uneasily into the surrounding gloom. His voice sank into a hushed tone. The wendigo, he added, is said to burn his feet, owing to the friction, apparently caused by its tremendous velocity, till they drop off and new ones form exactly like its own. Simpson listened in horrified amazement. But it was the pallor on Hank's face that fascinated him most. He would willingly have stopped his ears and closed his eyes, had he dared. It don't always keep to the ground, neither, came in Hank's slow, heavy drawl, for it goes so high that he thinks the stars have set him all afire, and it'll take great thump and jump sometimes, and run along the tops of the trees, carrying his partner with it, and then dropping them just as a fish hawk would drop a pickerel to kill it before eating, and it's food. Of all the muck in the whole bushes, moss. And he laughed a short, unnatural length. It's a moss eater, is the wind to go, he added, looking up excitedly into the faces of his companions. Moss eater, he repeated, with a string of the most outlandish oaths he could invent. But Simpson now understood the true purpose of all this talk. What these two men, each strong and experienced in his own way, dreaded more than anything else was. Silence. They were talking against time. They were also talking against darkness, against the invasion of panic, against the admission reflection might bring that they were in an enemy's country, against anything, in fact, rather than allow their inmost thoughts to assume control. He himself, already initiated by the awful vigil with terror, was beyond both of them in this respect. He had reached the stage where he was immune. But these two the scoffing analytical doctor, and the honest, dogged backwoodsman, each sat trembling in the depths of his being. Thus the hours passed, and thus, with lowered voices, and a kind of taut inner resistance of spirit, this little group of humanity sat in the jaws of the wilderness and talked foolishly of the terrible and haunting legend. It was an unequal contest, all things considered, for the wilderness had already the advantage of first attack and of a hostage. The fate of their comrade hung over them, with a steadily increasing weight of oppression that finally became insupportable. It was Hank, after a pause longer than the preceding ones that no one seemed able to break, who first let loose all this pent-up emotion in very unexpected fashion, by springing up suddenly to his feet and letting out the most ear-shattering yell imaginable into the night. He could not contain himself any longer, it seemed. To make it carry even beyond an ordinary cry, he interrupted its rhythm by shaking the palm of his hand before his mouth. That's for Defago, he said, looking down at the other two with a queer, defiant laugh. For it's my belief, the sandwiched oaths may be omitted, that my old partner is not far from us at this very minute. There was a vehemence and recklessness about his performance that made Simpson, too, start to his feet in amazement and betrayed even the doctor into letting the pipe slip from between his lips. Hank's face was ghastly, but Cathcart's showed a sudden weakness, a loosening of all his faculties, as it were. Then a momentary anger blazed into his eyes, and he too, though with deliberation born of habitual self-control, got upon his feet and faced the excited guide. For this was unpermissible, foolish, dangerous, and he meant to stop it in the bud. What might have happened in the next minute or two, one may speculate about, yet never definitely know, for in the instant of profound silence that followed Hank's roaring voice, and as though in answer to it, something went past through the darkness of the sky overhead at terrific speed, something of necessity very large, 
for it displaced much air, while down between the trees there fell a faint and windy cry of a human voice, calling in tones of indescribable anguish and appeal. Oh, oh, this fiery height! Oh, oh, my feet of fire! A burning feet of fire! White to the very edge of his shirt, Hank looked stupidly about him like a child. Dr. Cathcart uttered some kind of unintelligible cry, turning as he did so with an instinctive movement of blind terror towards the protection of the tent, then halting in the act as though frozen. Simpson, alone of the three, retained his presence of mind a little. His own horror was too deep to allow of any immediate reaction. He had heard that cry before. Turning to his stricken companions, he said almost calmly, That's exactly the cry I heard. The very words he used. Then, lifting his face to the sky, he cried aloud, The Fago, the Fago, come down here to us, come down. And before there was time for anybody to take definite action, one way or another, there came the sound of something dropping heavily between the trees, striking the branches on the way down, and landing with a dreadful thud upon the frozen earth below. The crash and thunder of it was really terrific. That's him, so help me the good God, came from Hank in a whispering cry half choked, his hand going automatically towards the hunting knife in his belt. And he's coming, he's coming, he added. With an irrational laugh of horror, as the sounds of heavy footsteps crunching over the snow became distinctly audible, approaching through the blackness towards the circle of light. And while the steps, with their stumbling motion, moved nearer and nearer upon them. The three men stood round that fire, motionless and dumb. Dr. Cathcart had the appearance of a man suddenly withered. Even his eyes did not move. Hank, suffering shockingly, seemed on the verge again of violent action, yet did nothing. He too was hewn of stone. Like stricken children they seemed, the picture was hideous. And meanwhile, their owner still invisible. The footsteps came closer, crunching the frozen snow. It was endless, too prolonged to be quite real. This measured and pitiless approach, it was accursed. Part 8 Then, at length the darkness, having thus laboriously conceived, brought forth a figure. It drew forward into the zone of uncertain light where fire and shadows mingled, not ten feet away, then halted, staring at them fixedly, the same instant it started forward again, with the spasmodic motion as of a thing moved by wires, and coming up closer to them, full into the glare of fire, they perceived then that it was a man, and apparently that this man was Defago. Something like a skin of horror almost perceptibly drew down in that moment over every face, and three pairs of eyes shone through as though they saw across the frontiers of normal vision into the unknown, Defago advanced, his tread faltering and uncertain. He made his way straight up to them as a group first, then turned sharply and peered close into the face of Simpson. The sound of a voice issued from his lips. Here I am, Boss Simpson. I heard someone calling me. It was a faint, dried-up voice, made wheezy and breathless as by immense exertion. I'm having a regular air fire kind of trip I am. And he laughed, thrusting his head forward into the other's face. But that laugh started the machinery of the group of waxwork figures with the wax-white skins. Hank immediately sprang forward with a stream of oaths so far-fetched that Simpson did not recognize them as English at all, but thought he had lapsed into Indian or some other lingo. He only realized that Hank's presence, thrust thus between them, was welcome. Uncommonly welcome. Dr. Cathcart, though more calmly and leisurely, advanced behind them, heavily stumbling. Simpson seems hazy as to what was actually said and done in those next few seconds, for the eyes of that detestable and blasted visage peering at such close quarters into his own utterly bewildered his senses at first. He merely stood still. He said nothing. He had not the trained will of the older men that forced them into action in defiance of all emotional stress. He watched them moving as behind a glass that half destroyed their reality. It was dreamlike, perverted. Yet through the torment of Hank's meaningless phrases, he remembers hearing his uncle's tone of authority, hard and focused, saying several things about food and warmth, blankets, whiskey, and the rest, 
and further that whiffs of that penetrating, unaccustomed odor, vile, yet sweetly bewildering, assailed his nostrils during all that followed. It was no less a person than himself, however less experienced and adroit than the others though he was, who gave extinctive utterance to the sentence that brought a measure of relief into the ghastly situation by expressing the doubt and thought in each one's heart. It is you, isn't it, Defago? He asked under his breath, horror breaking his speech. And at once, Cathcart burst out with his loud answer before the other had time to move his lips. Of course it is. Of course it is. Only, can't you see, he's nearly dead with exhaustion, cold and terror. Isn't that enough to change a man beyond all recognition? It was said in order to convince himself, as much as to convince the others. The overemphasis alone proved that. And continually, why he spoke and acted. He held a handkerchief to his nose. That odor pervaded the whole camp. For the Defago, who sat huddled by the big fire, wrapped in blankets, drinking hot whiskey and holding food in wasted hands, was no more like the guide they had last seen alive than the picture of a man of sixty is like a daguerreotype of his early youth in the costume of another generation. Nothing really can describe that ghastly caricature, that parody, masquerading there in the firelight as Defago. From the ruins of the dark and awful memories he still retains, Simpson declares that the face was more animal than human, the features drawn about into wrong proportions, the skin loose and hanging, as though he had been subjected to extraordinary pressures and tensions. It made him think vaguely of those bladder faces blown up by the hawkers on Ludgate Hill, that change their expression as they swell, and as they collapse and emit a faint, wailing imitation of a voice. Both face and voice suggested some such abominable resemblance. But Cathcart, long afterwards, seeking to describe the indescribable, asserts that thus might have looked a face and body that had been in air so rarefied that, the weight of atmosphere being removed, the entire structure threatened to fly asunder and become incoherent. It was Hank, though all distraught and shaking with a tearing volume of emotion he could neither handle nor understand, who brought things to a head without much ado. He went off to a little distance from the fire, apparently so that the light should not dazzle him too much, and shading his eyes for a moment with both hands shouted in a loud voice that held anger and affection dreadfully mingled. You ain't the Fago. You ain't the Fago at all. I don't give a damn. But that ain't you, my old pal of 20 years. He glared upon the huddled figure as though he would destroy him with his eyes. And if it is, I'll swab the floor of hell with a wad of cotton wool on a toothpick so help me the good God. He added, with a violent fling of horror and disgust. It was impossible to silence him. He stood there shouting like one possessed, horrible to see, horrible to hear, because it was the truth. He repeated himself in fifty different ways, each more outlandish than the last. The woods rang with echoes. At one time, it looked as if he meant to fling himself upon the intruder, for his hand continually jerked towards the long hunting knife in his belt. But in the end, he did nothing, and the whole tempest completed itself very shortly with tears. Hink's voice suddenly broke. He collapsed on the ground, and Cathcart somehow or other persuaded him at last to go into the tent and lie quiet. The remainder of the affair, indeed, was witnessed by him from behind the canvas, his white and terrified face peeping through the crack of the tent door flap. Then Dr. Cathcart, closely followed by his nephew, who so far had kept his courage better than all of them, went up with a determined air and stood opposite to the figure of Defago huddled over the fire. He looked him squarely in the face and spoke. At first, his voice was firm. Defago, tell us what happened. Just a little, so that we can know how best to help you. He asked in a tone of authority, almost of command. And at that point, it was command. At once afterwards, however, it changed in quality. For the figure turned up to him a face so piteous, so terrible, and so little like humanity the doctor shrank back from him as from something spiritually unclean. Simpson, watching close behind him, says he got the impression of a mask that was on the verge of dropping off, and that underneath they would discover something black and diabolical, revealed in utter nakedness. Out with it, man, out with it, Cathcart cried, terror running neck and neck with entreaty. None of us can stand this much longer. It was the cry of instinct over reason. 
And then Defago, smiling whitely, answered in that thin and fading voice that already seemed passing over into a sound of quite another character. I've seen that great Wendigo thing, he whispered, sniffing the air about him exactly like an animal. I've been with it too. Whether the poor devil would have said more, or whether Dr. Cathcart would have continued the impossible cross-examination, cannot be known. For at that moment the voice of Hank was heard yelling at the top of his voice from behind the canvas that concealed all but his terrified eyes. Such a howling was never heard. His feet! Oh God, his feet! Look at his great changed feet! Defago, shuffling where he sat, had moved in such a way that for the first time his legs were in full light and his feet were visible. Yet Simpson had no time himself to see properly what Hank had seen. And Hank has never seen fit to tell. That same instant, with a leap like that of a frightened tiger, Cathcart was upon him, bundling the folds of blanket about his legs with such speed that a young student caught little more than a passing glimpse of something dark and oddly masked where moccasined feet ought to have been, and saw even that but with uncertain vision. Then, before the doctor had time to do more, or Simpson time to even think a question, much less ask it, Defago was standing upright in front of them, balancing with pain and difficulty, and upon his shapeless and twisted visage, an expression so dark and so malicious that it was, in the true sense, monstrous. Now you've seen it too, he wheezed. You see my fiery burning feet. And now, that is, unless you can save me and prevent it's about time for... His piteous yet beseeching voice was interrupted by a sound that was like the roar of wind coming across the lake. The trees overhead shook their tangled branches. The blazing fire bent its flames as before a blast. And something swept with a terrific rushing noise about the little camp, and seemed to surround it entirely in a single moment of time. Defago shook the clinging blankets from his body turned towards the woods behind, and with the same stumbling motion that had brought him, was gone. Gone, before anyone could move muscle to prevent him. Gone with an amazing, blundering swiftness that left no time to act. The darkness positively swallowed him, and less than a dozen seconds later, above the roar of the swaying trees and the shout of the sudden wind, all three men, watching and listening with stricken hearts, heard a cry that seemed to drop down upon them from a great height of sky and distance. Oh, oh, this fiery height. Oh, oh, my feet of fire. My burning feet of fire. Then died away into untold space and silence. Dr. Cathcart suddenly mastered himself, and therefore of the others was just able to seize Hank violently by the arm as he tried to dash headlong into the bush. But I want to know you, shrieked the guide. I want to see that it ain't him at all but some devil that's shunted into his place. Somehow or other, he admits he never quite knew how he accomplished it. He managed to keep him in the tent and pacify him. The doctor, apparently, had reached the stage where reaction had set in and allowed his innate force to conquer. Certainly, he managed Hank admirably. It was his nephew, however, hitherto so wonderfully controlled, who gave him most cause for anxiety for the cumulative strain had now produced a condition of lacrimose hysteria, which made it necessary to isolate him upon a bed of boughs and blankets as far removed from Hank as was possible under the circumstances. And there he lay, as the watches of that haunted night passed over the lonely camp, crying startled sentences, and fragments of sentences, into the folds of his blanket. A quantity of gibberish about speed and height and fire mingled oddly with biblical memories of the classroom. People with broken faces all on fire are coming at a most awful, awful pace towards the camp. He would moan one minute, and the next would sit up and stare into the woods, intently listening and whisper, How terrible in the wilderness are, are the feet of them that, until his uncle came across to change the direction of his thoughts and comfort him. The hysteria, fortunately, proved but temporary. Sleep cured him, just as it cured Hank. Till the first signs of daylight came, Soon after five o'clock, Dr. Cathcart kept his vigil. His face was the color of chalk, and there were strange flushes beneath the eyes. An appalling terror of the soul battled with his will all through those silent hours. These were some of the outer signs. At dawn, he lit the fire himself, made breakfast, and woke the others, and by seven they were well on their way back to the home camp. Three perplexed and afflicted men, but each in his own way, 
having reduced his inner turmoil to a condition of more or less systematized order again. Part 9 They talked little, and then only of the most wholesome and common things, for their minds were charged with painful thoughts that clamored for explanation. Though no one dared refer to them, Hank, being nearest to primitive conditions, was the first to find himself, for he was also less complex. In Dr. Cathcart's civilization championed his forces against an attack singular enough. To this day, perhaps, he is not quite sure of certain things. Anyhow, he took longer to find himself. Simpson, the student of divinity, it was who arranged his conclusions probably with the best, though not most scientific, appearance of order. Out there, in the heart of unreclaimed wilderness, they had surely witnessed something crudely and essentially primitive. Something that had survived somehow, the advance of humanity, had emerged terrifically, betraying a scale of life still monstrous and immature. He envisaged it rather as a glimpse into prehistoric ages, when superstitions, gigantic and uncouth, still oppressed the hearts of men. When the forces of nature were still untamed, the powers that may have haunted a primeval universe not yet withdrawn. To this day, he thinks of what he termed years later in a sermon, savage and formidable potencies lurking behind the souls of men, not evil perhaps in themselves, yet instinctively hostile to humanity as it exists. With his uncle, he never discussed the matter in detail, for the barrier between the two types of mind made it difficult. Only once, years later, something led them to the frontier of the subject, of a single detail of the subject, rather. Can you even tell me what they were like? He asked, and the reply, though conceived in wisdom, was not encouraging. It is far better you should not try to know or to find out. Well, that odor, persisted the nephew. How do you make of that? Dr. Cathcart looked at him and raised his eyebrows. Odors, he replied, are not so easy as sounds and sights of telepathic communication. I make as much, or as little, probably as you do yourself. He was not quite so glib as usual with his explanations. That was all. At the fall of day, cold, exhausted, famished, the party came to the end of the long portage and dragged themselves into a camp that at first glimpse seemed empty. Fire there was none, and no punk came forward to welcome them. The emotional capacity of all three was too overspent to recognize either surprise or annoyance. But the cry of spontaneous affection that burst from the lips of Hank as he rushed ahead of them towards the fireplace came probably as a warning that the end of the amazing affair was not quite yet. And both Cathcart and his nephew confessed afterwards that when they saw him kneel down in his excitement and embrace something that reclined, gently moving, beside the extinguished ashes, they felt in their very bones that this something would prove to be Defago, the true Defago, returned. And so, indeed it was. It is soon told, exhausted to the point of emaciation, the French-Canadian, what was left of him, that is, fumbled among the ashes, trying to make a fire, his body crouched there, the weak fingers obeying feebly the instinctive habit of a lifetime with twigs and matches. But there was no longer any mind to direct the simple operation. The mind had fled beyond recall, and with it too had fled memory. Not only recent events, but all previous life was a blank. This time, it was the real man, though incredibly and horribly shrunken, on his face was no expression of any kind whatever, fear, welcome, or recognition. He did not seem to know who it was that embraced him, or who it was that fed, warmed, and spoke to him the words of comfort and relief. Forlorn and broken beyond all reach of human aid, the little man did meekly as he was bidden. The something that had constituted him individual had vanished forever. In some ways it was more terribly moving than anything they had yet seen. That idiot smile he drew was, of course, mods from his swollen cheeks and told them that he was a damned moss eater, the continued vomiting of even the simplest food, and worst of all, the piteous and childish voice of complaint in which he told them that his feet pained him, burned like fire, which was natural enough when Dr. Cathcart examined them and found that both were dreadfully frozen. Beneath the eyes were faint indications of recent bleeding, the details of how he survived the prolonged exposure of where he had been, or of how he covered the great distance from one camp to the other, 
including an immense detour of the lake on foot since he had no canoe. All of this remains unknown. His memory had vanished completely, and before the end of the winter, who is beginning witness this strange occurrence, Defago, bereft of mind, memory, and soul, had gone with it. He lingered only a few weeks. And what Punk was able to contribute to the story throws no further light upon it. He was cleaning fish by the lake shore about five o'clock in the evening. An hour, that is, before the search party returned, when he saw the shadow of the guide picking its way weakly into camp. In advance of him, he declares, came the faint whiff of a certain singular odor. That same instant, old Punk started for home. He covered the entire journey of three days, as only Indian blood could have covered it. The terror of a whole race drove him. He knew what it all meant. Defago had seen the Wendigo. End of The Wendigo by Algernon Blackwood The Werewolf by Eugene Field This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Louise J. Bell The Werewolf by Eugene Field in the reign of Egbert the Saxon, there dwelt in Britain a maiden named Isolt, who was beloved of all, both for her goodness and for her beauty. But though many a youth came wooing her, she loved Harold only, and to him she plighted her troth. Among the other youth of whom Isolt was beloved was Alfred, and he was sore angered that Isolt showed favor to Harold, so that one day Alfred said to Harold, Is it right that old Siegfried should come from his grave and have Isolt to wife? Then added he, Prithee, good sir, why do you turn so white when I speak your grandsire's name? Then Harold asked, What know you of Siegfried that you taunt me? What memory of him should vex me now? We know and we know, retorted Alfred. There are some tales told us by our grandmas we have not forgot. So ever after that, Alfred's words and Alfred's bitter smile haunted Harold by day and night. Harold's grandsire, Siegfried the Teuton, had been a man of cruel violence. The legend said that a curse rested upon him, and that at certain times he was possessed of an evil spirit that wreaked its fury on mankind. But Siegfried had been dead full many years and there was naught to mind the world of him save the legend, and a cunning wrought spear which he had from Brunhilde the witch. This spear was such a weapon that it never lost its brightness, nor had its point been blunted. It hung in Harold's chamber, and it was the marvel among weapons of that time. Isolt knew that Alfred loved her, but she did not know of the bitter words which Alfred had spoken to Harold. Her love for Harold was perfect in its trust and gentleness. But Alfred had hit the truth. The curse of old Siegfried was upon Harold, slumbering a century it had awakened in the blood of the grandson, and Harold knew the curse that was upon him, and it was this that seemed to stand between him and Isolt. But love is stronger than all else, and Harold loved. Harold did not tell Isolt of the curse that was upon him, for he feared that she would not love him if she knew. 
whensoever he felt the fire of the curse burning in his veins, he would say to her, Tomorrow I hunt the wild boar in the uttermost forest. Or, Next week I go stag-stalking among the distant northern hills. Even so it was that he ever made good excuse for his absence, and Isolt thought no evil things, for she was trustful. Aye, though he went many times away, and was long gone, Isolt suspected no wrong. So none beheld Harold when the curse was upon him in its violence. Alfred alone bethought himself of evil things. "'Tis passing strange,' quoth he, "'that ever and anon this gallant lover should quit our company, "'and betake himself whither none knoweth. "'In sooth twill be well to have an eye on old Siegfried's grandson.' Harold knew that Alfred watched him zealously, and he was tormented by a constant fear that Alfred would discover the curse that was on him. But what gave him greater anguish was the fear that mayhap at some moment, when he was in Isolt's presence, the curse would seize upon him and cause him to do great evil unto her whereby she would be destroyed, or her love for him would be undone forever. So Harold lived in terror, feeling that his love was hopeless, yet knowing not how to combat it. Now it befell in those times that the country round about was ravaged of a werewolf, a creature that was feared by all men, howe'er so valorous. This werewolf was by day a man, but by night a wolf, given to ravage and to slaughter, and having a charmed life against which no human agency availed aught. Wheresoever he went, he attacked and devoured mankind, spreading terror and desolation round about. And the dream readers said that the earth would not be freed from the werewolf until some man offered himself a voluntary sacrifice to the monster's rage. Now, although Harold was known far and wide as a mighty huntsman, he had never set forth to hunt the werewolf and, strange you know, the werewolf never ravaged the domain while Harold was therein. Whereat Alfred marveled much, and oftentimes he said, Our Harold is a wondrous huntsman. Who is like unto him in stalking the timid doe and in crippling the fleeing boar? But how passing well doth he time his absence from the haunts of the werewolf? Such valor beseemeth our young Siegfried. Which being brought to Harold, his heart flamed with anger. But he made no answer, lest he should betray the truth he feared. It happened so about that time that Isolt said to Harold, Wilt thou go with me to-morrow, even to the feast in the sacred grove? That can I not do, answered Harold. I am privily summoned hence to Normandy upon a mission, of which I shall some time tell thee. And I pray thee, on thy love for me, go not to the feast in the sacred grove without me. What sayest thou? cried Isolt. Shall I not go to the feast of St. Alfreda? 
My father would be sore displeased were I not there with the other maidens. Twere greatest pity that I should despite his love thus. But do not, I beseech thee, Harold implored. Go not to the feast of St. Alfreda in the sacred grove. And thou would thus love me, go not. See, thou, my life, on my two knees I ask it. How pale thou art, said Isolde, and trembling. Go not to the sacred grove upon the morrow night, he begged. Isolt marveled at his acts and at his speech. Then, for the first time, she thought him to be jealous, whereat she secretly rejoiced, being a woman. Ah, quoth she, thou dost doubt my love. But when she saw a look of pain come on his face, she added, as if she repented of the words she had spoken. Or dost thou fear the werewolf? Then Harold answered, fixing his eyes on hers. Thou hast said it. It is the werewolf that I fear. Why dost thou look at me so strangely, Harold? cried Isolde. By the cruel light in thine eyes, one might almost take thee to be the werewolf. Come hither, sit beside me, said Harold tremblingly, and I will tell thee why I fear to have thee go to the feast of St. Alfreda tomorrow evening. Hear what I dreamt last night. I dreamt... I was the werewolf. Do not shudder, dear love, for twas only a dream. A grizzled old man stood at my bedside and strove to pluck my soul from my bosom. What wouldst thou? I cried. Thy soul is mine, he said. Thou shalt live out my curse. Give me thy soul. Hold back thy hands. Give me thy soul, I say. Thy curse shall not be upon me, I cried. What have I done that thy curse should rest upon me? Thou shalt not have my soul. For my offense shalt thou suffer and in my curse thou shalt endure hell. It is so decreed. So spake the old man, and he strove with me, and he prevailed against me, and he plucked my soul from my bosom, and he said, Go, search and kill. And, and, lo, I was a wolf upon the moor. The dry grass crackled beneath my tread. The darkness of the night was heavy, and it oppressed me. Strange horrors tortured my soul, and it groaned and groaned, jailed in that wolfish body. The wind whispered to me. With its myriad voices it spake to me, and said, Go, search and kill. And above these voices sounded the hideous laughter of an old man. I fled the moor, whither I knew not, nor knew I what motive lashed me on. I came to a river, and I plunged in. A burning thirst consumed me, and I lapped the waters of the river. They were waves of flame, and they flashed around me and hissed, and what they said was, Go, 
search and kill. And I heard the old man's laughter again. A forest lay before me, with its gloomy thickets and its somber shadows, with its ravens, its vampires, its serpents, its reptiles, and all its hideous brood of night. I darted among its thorns and crouched amid the leaves, the nettles and the brambles. The owls hooted at me, and the thorns pierced my flesh. Go, search and kill, said everything. The hares sprang from my pathway. The other beasts ran bellowing away. Every form of life shrieked in my ears. The curse was on me. I was the werewolf. On, on I went with the fleetness of the wind, and my soul groaned in its wolfish prison. And the winds and the waters and the trees bade me go, search, and kill, thou accursed brute. Go, search, and kill. Nowhere was there pity for the wolf. What mercy thus should I, the werewolf, show? The curse was on me, and it filled me with a hunger and a thirst for blood. Skulking on my way, within myself I cried, Let me have blood. Oh, let me have human blood, that this wrath may be appeased, that this curse may be removed. At last I came to the sacred grove. Somber loomed the poplars. The oaks frowned upon me. Before me stood an old man. Twas he, grizzled and taunting, whose curse I bore. He feared me not. All other living things fled before me. But the old man feared me not. A maiden stood beside him. She did not see me, for she was blind. Kill, kill, cried the old man, and he pointed at the girl beside him. Hell raged within me. The curse impelled me. I sprang at her throat. I heard the old man's laughter once more. And then, then I awoke, trembling, cold, horrified. Scarce was this dream told when Alfred strode that way. Now, by our lady, quoth he, I bethink me never to have seen a sorrier twain. Then Isolt told him of Harold's going away, and how that Harold had besought her not to venture to the feast of St. Alfreda in the sacred grove. These fears are childish, cried Alfred boastfully. And thou sufferest me, sweet lady, I will bear thee company to the feast, and a score of my lusty yeomen with their good yew-bows and honest spears, they shall attend me. There be no werewolf, I trow, will chance about with us. Whereat Isolt laughed merrily, and Harold said, "'Tis well. Thou shalt go to the sacred grove, and may my love and heaven's grace forfend all evil. Then Harold went to his abode, and he fetched old Siegfried's spear back unto Isolt. 
and he gave it into her two hands, saying, Take this spear with thee to the feast tomorrow night. It is old Siegfried's spear, possessing mighty virtue and marvelous. And Harold took Isolt to his heart and blessed her, and he kissed her upon her brow and upon her lips, saying, Farewell, O my beloved. How wilt thou love me when thou knowest my sacrifice? Farewell, farewell forever, O Alderleafest mine. So Harold went his way, and Isolt was lost in wonderment. On the morrow night came Isolt to the sacred grove wherein the feast was spread, and she bore old Siegfried's spear with her in her girdle. Alfred attended her, and a score of lusty yeomen were with him. In the grove there was great merriment, and with singing and dancing and games withal did the honest folk celebrate the feast of the fair St. Alfreda. But suddenly a mighty tumult arose, and there were cries of, THE WEREWOLF! THE WEREWOLF! Terror seized upon all. Stout hearts were frozen with fear. Out from the further forest rushed the werewolf, wood wroth, bellowing hoarsely, gnashing his fangs and tossing hither and thither the yellow foam from his snapping jaws. He sought Isolt straight, as if an evil power drew him to the spot where she stood. But Isolt was not afeard. Like a marble statue she stood and saw the werewolves coming. The yeomen, dropping their torches and casting aside their bows, had fled. Alfred alone abided there to do the monster battle. At the approaching wolf he hurled his heavy lance, but as it struck the werewolf's bristling back, the weapon was all too shivered. Then the werewolf, fixing his eyes upon Isolde, skulked for a moment in the shadow of the yews, and thinking then of Harold's words, Isolt plucked old Siegfried's spear from her girdle, raised it on high, and with the strength of despair sent it hurtling through the air. The werewolf saw the shining weapon, and a cry burst from his gaping throat, a cry of human agony. And Isolt saw in the werewolf's eyes, the eyes of someone she had seen and known. But twas for an instant only, and then the eyes were no longer human, but wolfish in their ferocity. A supernatural force seemed to speed the spear in its flight. With fearful precision, the weapon smote home and buried itself by half its length in the werewolf's shaggy breast, just above the heart. And then, with a monstrous sigh, as if he yielded up his life without regret, the werewolf fell dead in the shadow of the yews. Then... Ah, then in very truth there was great joy, and loud were the acclaims. While, beautiful in her trembling pallor, Isolt was led unto her home, where the people set about to give great feast to do her homage. 
for the werewolf was dead, and she it was that had slain him. But Isolde cried out, Go, search for Harold. Go, bring him to me, nor eat nor sleep till he be found. Good, my lady, quoth Alfred, how can that be, since he hath betaken himself to Normandy? I care not where he be, she cried. My heart stands still until I look into his eyes again. Surely he hath not gone to Normandy, outspake Ubert. This very eventide I saw him enter his abode. They hastened thither, a vast company. His chamber door was barred. Harold, Harold, come forth, they cried, as they beat upon the door. But no answer came to their calls and knockings. Afeard, they battered down the door, and when it fell, they saw that Harold lay upon his bed. He sleeps, said one. See, he holds a portrait in his hand, and it is her portrait. How fair he is, and how tranquilly he sleeps. But, no, Harold was not asleep. His face was calm and beautiful, as if he dreamt of his beloved. But... His raiment was red with the blood that streamed from a wound in his breast, a gaping, ghastly spear wound just above his heart. End of The Werewolf Recording by Louise J. Bell Sebastopol, California